Welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I am your host and co-founder, Aaron Brightman. Thanks so much for listening once again. Coming to you midweek of the third week of April, and uh, we are a few days into uh, the regular signing period for college basketball. A little bit different than football. It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's really spread out uh, in terms of the first day not being uh as I guess celebrated as it is in college football, but uh, it's been a interesting uh, few days for Rutgers basketball in regard to the 2023 recruiting class. And I wanted to take this episode to kind of focus on that. There's a lot of uh, developments that have happened and uh, you know, there's been a lot reported. There's been a lot rumored. And um, I was kind of waiting to pick my spot in terms of when I was ready to address uh, some things. And um Definitely think we're at that stage. So wanted to do that now. So let's let's dive in. Just talking about Rutgers men's basketball, specifically for this episode in the 2023 recruiting class. Uh, one thing we know for certain is Gavin Griffiths, uh, the highest uh, rated uh, recruit to ever sign with Rutgers in modern, modern day. Uh, number 39 recruit in the 2023 class, high four-star recruit. Obviously uh, considered, uh, and I say obviously in the sense of I've talked about it so much, but uh, he's arguably the best shooter in the 2023 class. That's not my opinion. That is of uh, several scouts and recruiting services uh, that cover uh, recruiting across the country. And, um, you know, he's going to give Rutgers a huge presence on the wing from day one, six, seven, uh, needs to bulk up. Uh, number two player in Connecticut had a very, very good senior year. Uh, and just super excited to have him on board. Uh, you know, he's a, a good ball handler. Uh, he is a just pure shooter. And to have him on the perimeter along with Cam Spencer is really going to help uh, Rutgers take a step forward offensively. Obviously, with Noah Fernandes now, who uh, came last week. Uh, they have some, some real offensive talent. Uh, and those three in particular uh, should really excite Rutgers fans. So... Griffiths is signed his letter of intent uh, in November. Uh, he's full board. Uh, he'll be on campus soon enough and, uh, you know, fully involved in the offseason program. So uh, obviously, if, uh, you know, of everyone that uh, Rutgers is uh, linked to for the 2023 class uh, in terms of commitments, having Gavin Griffiths signed, sealed, and delivered uh, is the, the best possible scenario uh, if you had to choose just one. That being said, uh, Jamichael Davis, a, a three-star uh, guard from Georgia, obviously the connection to um, five-star Ace Bailey, who is verbally committed for the 2024 class. I've written about him quite a bit. Uh, Jamichael Davis is a 6'2 point guard, uh, long, long-time friend of uh, Ace Bailey, grew up together. Uh, Powder Springs, Georgia, uh, McEachern High School, uh, he's rated right now uh, 213th nationally uh, in the 2023 class for 24-7 uh, sports composite, 31st uh, uh, point guard in the class, 17 uh, number 17 recruit in Georgia. So Davis, you know, he's a uh, really athletic uh, guard who can defend, get downhill. He uh, got the three-star rating late in um, his senior year. Rutgers really recruited him under the radar. Obviously, ties to Ace Bailey uh, has to be considered a factor, no doubt. But I do think that Rutgers sees real value in Jamichael Davis. I think he fits in really well defensively. I think that he makes them more athletic. And I think that, yes, he's going to take time to develop. But I, I really like what I've seen from him on film just in terms of his potential. Uh, and I, I kind of where I think – a recruit like him helps bring Rutgers in the future. I think it's obvious, you know, everyone says, oh, they have to improve offensively. But I thought that one thing that was kind of painfully obvious at the end of the season, this past season, was that Rutgers needed to, they, they needed to get a lot more athletic. Um, just in terms of uh, athleticism from a depth perspective, but also from a high-end perspective, you know, they, they didn't, ha they haven't had a lot of high-end Big Ten Athletes as basketball players. Cliff Omori is obviously one, but there's a pretty big drop off, I think, uh, or has been for the most part 
just in terms of pure athleticism. And I think to Michael Davis checks that box big time. So um, long story short, he is not signed yet. Um, you know, I'm being told that he's very firm. Uh, I believe that, you know, the, there's uh, in terms of his signing ceremony, he wants to have a lot of family there. So I think it's just a logistical thing. There, there does not seem to be any concern. And again, like I mentioned, I mean, this signing period goes through May. Uh, this is not like football where it's kind of a rush scenario and it's uh, pretty immediate. Um, basketball is a different di di different animal in that regard. So um, things are sounding very good for Jermichael Davis. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously Rutgers fans will breathe a little bit easier, uh, not only for Davis, but in terms of this ties to, to East Bailey once he does. But, um, you know, I think that it will happen uh, sooner rather than later. So where it really gets interesting for Rutgers uh, in 2023 recruiting class is Bay Nadango, uh, recruited by Carl Hobbs, who was reported last week and now known that has left Rutgers to go to Georgia Tech as the associate head coach there under new head coach Damon Stoudemire. Uh, so Nadango was recruited by Hobbs uh, and Hobbs leaving um, you know, there's been a lot of speculation on this and, um, you know, I'm going to kind of give my two cents on it. Uh, I, I, you know, th there's concern and a lot of grumblings that, you know, as Hobbs taking, uh, Nadango with him to Georgia tech, it does not sound like that's the case. Um, you know, and I, I as soon as I heard that kind of theory, I, I really, maybe I'm, I'm the eternal optimist, but, um, Carl Hobbs and C. Pike will go back decades uh, I just could not imagine that that Hobbs would burn that bridge uh, by doing that. Um, you know, listen, assistant coaches do it all the time, uh, and they you know kind of use commitments from recruits as a way to get a, a different job. Uh, it happens, but I did not suspect that that was what Hobbs was doing, and I don't think that that's what's happening. Um, it does sound like that him leaving open the door for Nadango to consider other options. Now it's important to remember here, you know, Nadango is an international player. So typically international players, you know, he played at Colorado prep. He, he's been in prep school now in Connecticut, but international players typically have handlers, guardians. Uh, and it does sound like from what everything I've kind of been told and heard and seen is that, you know, he, the feeling is, is that he still wants to go to Rutgers, but uh, it's complicated in the, in the fact that, you know, people that are involved in his recruitment on his end, um, you know, are exploring other options, it sounds like. So obviously NIL could be a, a huge factor here. Uh, it sounds like Georgetown with Ed Cooley is, is in play. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know about Georgia Tech specifically, but it, it, that seemed to be the buzz early on. And then I really haven't heard much of that in the last few days. Uh, and who, who knows who else is involved um, in terms of trying to uh, poach him at the last minute. I think, you know, it's uh, it's 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 a new world in terms of recruiting. You know, you don't you never really used to see this much in college basketball recruiting. It was typically football where you saw recruits, you know, flipped uh, at the last minute before signing day. Um, this is obviously something different uh, with, with NIL and the transfer portal now. And, um, you know, we'll have to see. But I will say that I'm more optimistic that he ends up at Rutgers than I was even 48 hours ago from just what I'm hearing. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a wait and see. Obviously, it puts Rutgers in a tough spot. Uh, I'm sure they're doing everything they can to save it. Uh, and again, I've heard from multiple multiple sources that you know he he does – every indication is that he – He's a kid that wants to go to Rutgers, you know. He even wrote on his social media, they said that 10,000% committed. So, um, again, it's complicated. Uh, we'll have to see what happens there. But, uh, you know, it makes it even more interesting with the news today uh, being Tuesday, April 18th, uh, with the news that Papa Conte, uh, previous top target of Rutgers and very good friend of Gavin Griffiths, it comes full circle now. Uh, has asked for the release of his letter of intent from Michigan. He originally chose Michigan over Maryland and Rutgers. Uh, and I should mention that Ndongo and Conte are very similar. They're both from Senegal. They're both 6'8". There's been, you know, I've seen Ndongo uh, listed at a little bit taller than that. I've even seen 6'10". But they're, uh, they're similar builds, but they are different players. Uh, 
Conte is much more ahead uh, in his development defensively. He's a natural rim defender, uh, and he is a very good rebounder, where uh, Nadango is much more perimeter-oriented uh, and can create his own shot on offense. Um, he is needs some refinement, but um, from a kind of uh, how their, their, their games have evolved so far, Nadango is more offensive and Conte is more defensive. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is because it raises an interesting question now. So Conte asked for his release. You know, there's a lot of speculation there as well. And, um, you know, I don't like to speculate. I am going to cite uh, a uh, source uh, public article, MGO blog, which is a Michigan blog, uh, confirms, uh, and I've heard this independently, but the fact that this is reported, that, um, and I've seen this misinterpreted, uh on Rutgers message boards and, and and people as well is it that it's uh not an academic issue uh with with Conte uh and remember international students th there's additional requirements to get into colleges uh, aside from their academics and um from what uh I understand is that it is on a, a, the admission side and it, it has to do with the test that is referred to, you know, with, with English as a second language. And from what I understand, it's actually pretty difficult. It's analytical um, and it's it's not an easy thing. And and the issue is that Michigan has a much higher standard in terms of, uh, the I guess, the score on the test as opposed to the national average, the Big Ten average. From what I understand, Rutgers is still above that national average and that Big Ten average. Um, but is lower than Michigan. Now, I don't know what the status is. I don't know if Rutgers is my whole point in comparing uh, or discussing Conte and Ndongo together is that it poses an interesting scenario where Rutgers could potentially add both now. Both are four-star recruits. Uh, both, I think, have a lot of potential. Um, Bay Ndongo right now is, uh, he was recently elevated to a four-star uh, in the 24-7 sports uh, composite ranking, he is listed as the 118th recruit in the 2023 class, number 26 power forward, number five recruit in Connecticut, uh, player grade of 90.9412, uh, uh, where you have um, uh, Papacante, who's uh, similarly ranked 107th in the in the composite rankings, 94.94A4 uh, player grade, Number 14, center, number third recruit in Connecticut. So, you know, Conte is, uh, uh, you know, I think at 6'10", uh, you know, they're both, they're both been listed anywhere between 6'8 and 6'10". Conte, I think, is definitely more of a natural center. I think Nadango is more of a stretch four. So they, they, they offer different skill sets. Um, if all things being equal... Uh, with the current roster, uh, and I'm pretty comfortable confirming these seven players being back, uh, Derek Simpson, uh, Cam Spencer, Mawat Mag, Antonio Chol, Andre Hyatt, and Antoine Wolfolk. And then you bring in Luis, uh, uh, excuse me, Noah Fernandes. That's seven right there. Then you have Griffiths uh, at eight. Uh, we know he signed. Let's assume... Cliff and Paul return in this scenario. Uh, and then you have Davis, Nadango, and Conte. If all three of those sign, Rutgers is at their limit then. So they potentially can sign all three uh, recruits. Again, Davis, feel very strongly, will sign very soon. Uh, Nadango, I still believe he will sign, um, but it's fair to be concerned and to question it. And then Conte is kind of, you know, I don't want to say out of the blue. I mean, th th this rumor has been circulating for a while uh, and new, it kind of came to fruition today. Uh, I am, you know, hearing that, you know, he has former coaches at Pitt and uh, Memphis. Uh, so I've heard Pitt specifically is, is potentially a uh, big factor now in as he reopens his recruitment. And then also you have to remember that Maryland, he chose uh, Michigan over Rutgers and Maryland. So I don't think, you know, and, and I think going back to what I was saying about Nadago and Conte, will the staff, is the staff interested in, in, in bringing Conte in? At first glance, 
you know, I was wondering if it was too redundant in terms of, of them just being, uh, you know, two, four, fives, uh, similar build, similar size, but you know, uh, their skill sets are different. Uh, I do believe that Rutgers is probably considering big men options in the portal. I know in the past that Steve Peichel, you know, has been very concerned about managing the roster. He's typically, you know, held an open scholarship uh, and usually gives it to a walk on, which I do love that part. But um, he's he's prioritized in the past in terms of, you know, at worry is the wrong word, but just managing um I guess expectations in terms of roles and kind of the readiness of certain players. So there, there wasn't, uh, I guess you could say almost like a, a potential jam and having too many options and not enough playing time where I really think that now as a nowadays, like this year, the way the portal has become uh, the way NIL has become a factor it's it, we're, we're truly in a one year roster management scenario for all high major college basketball. I mean, all, all college basketball programs. Uh, it really is that um, unstable in terms of turnover, in terms of transfers, in terms of, uh, you know, changing of rosters, turnovers uh, in terms of people declaring going out early, but also just with NIL lore, you know, you have people transferring back to back years, even though the NCAA apparently has not apparently, but does have a rule that, you know, your second transfer, if you're still an undergrad, you're going to have to sit out a year, but people are still doing it. And, you know, there, there are exceptions made. I think when, you know, coaches leave, it's probably will will get, uh, you know, approved. But there's a bunch of different cases. And as we know about the NCA, they're very inconsistent in how they rule on things. But my long winded point is, you know, if you're Steve Peichel, I think and, and I do. I, I mean, I can't I listen. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what the coaching staff's thinking, but I do think it's a natural time to reassess kind of philosophical uh, approaches in terms of the roster. Right. And I think what we learned from last season was at the end of the day, if you don't have enough depth, it's going to burn you. And I do think that if Rutgers can close on the Dongo and the admissions issue that Conte had uh, reportedly at Michigan is not an issue at Rutgers I think that that is a very intriguing scenario for Rutgers to add both Bay Nadango and Papa Conte uh, in the same recruiting class. Yes, it gives you two freshman bigs, but two very talented freshman bigs. It gives you two uh, big men with different skill sets. You have Antoine Wolfolk returning as a sophomore. You have potentially Cliff O'Mori. And this is the other thing, too, that you have to consider if, if you're the coaching staff. If Conte is a, a, a take, right, Cliff potentially could not come back. You know, he may or could not is the wrong phrasing, may not come back. Say he does, you know, want to stay in the NBA draft or, you know, he goes into the G League. He has a pretty good idea he's going to end up in the G League or he has an overseas offer. Um, taking Conte and... Um, Nadongo still gives you an open spot that you could add a transfer big man, but you would look even, you would be much better off depth wise if you took both of them. If Cliff ultimately leaves, we, we don't know. Cliff is, you know, the deadline uh, to withdraw from the NBA draft for early enrollment, I believe, is uh, early entrance, I believe, is June 12th. Uh, if not exactly the 12th, it's right around then. Um, but I think that Peichel has always had contingency plan for contingency plan for contingency plan throughout his tenure at Rutgers as a recruiter. And this is a very interesting scenario. You know, obviously Conte is very close with Gavin Griffiths, I'm told, very close with his family. Uh, and this is a very uh, – intriguing scenario I, you know I, I i really had hoped conte would choose Rutgers initially but it doesn't matter i mean listen the kid had a dream to go to, to uh I, I really had hoped he would choose Rutgers over michigan he had a dream to go to michigan it's, it's really unfortunate you know 
I, I, um, my, uh, my partner, Anthony Wright, former Michigan basketball player, uh, you know, he owns the full ride network and we're partners together in the Scarlet faithful. And he, he was saying that, you know, this was not Michigan staff wanted him, <laughs> uh, and, and, and Conte wanted Michigan. It was, it was an admissions issue. So, um, you know, uh, Anthony, uh, has been pretty adamant about that all day today. Uh, so, uh, unfortunate and, and, for, for sad for, for Conte. I mean, that, that is not going to happen for him, but I do think for him personally, you know, and he has to do what's best for him. And it, it that may, might mean Maryland. It might mean Pitt. It might mean Memphis. It might mean somewhere else, but um, you know, and he played in the schoolboy classic uh, in Connecticut uh, recently against New Jersey uh, with Gavin Griffiths, a uh, all-star game uh, that um, you know, notable, uh, uh, Rutgers supporter Richard Kent uh, runs. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about just the two of them having so much fun playing together. And this is a, you know, the door closed and now it's reopened. And again, we don't know what the staff is thinking. We don't know if, um, you know, Conte would be uh, an option in terms of uh, what is their plans currently. You know, I always kind of uh, laugh when people automatically assume when players enter transfer portal from other schools that if Rutgers had once recruited them, they must be back on the radar. That's not always the case uh, for sure. Um, this is obviously a little different and, you know, time, not as much time has passed. Conte would still be an incoming freshman. Uh, so it's a, it's a very unique situation too, I think. And um, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens, but there is certainly you know, uh, having Gavin Griffiths on your team and the relationship he has with Papa Conte certainly makes it, um, you know, very possible that he could ultimately end up at Rutgers. Again, we don't know what the staff's thinking. Um, and I just think the dynamics of the roster, you know, I was thinking initially, well, if Natango was signed already, I think in a way, and I'm just spitballing here, but you know, who knows? It could end up being a blessing in the sense of if Nadango ultimately does sign, but this kind of uh blip occurred where it took him a while to ultimately sign. Point being, you know, he's he has not signed his letter of intent, so he's not hundred percent committed to Rutgers yet. So if he was hundred percent committed and then Rutgers took Conte. You know, do you worry that, oh, well, you're you're kind of upsetting Nadango because you're recruiting right uh, position uh, and players rated slightly higher than him uh, and, and similar uh, position uh, to him. Uh, but that's that's not the scenario now. That's not the scenario now. And he still has options. Obviously, it's elite in the game recruiting wise, but it does appear, you know, he's he has um, some potential opportunities elsewhere. Uh, and NIL is most likely a factor. So my point is if they both end up at Rutgers, I think Rutgers is doing the right thing and not misleading or surprising anyone. And that goes back to my greater point with Peichel in terms of managing the roster, worrying about keeping everyone happy. You know, and that's I say that out of respect to him because he, I mean, if you don't think Steve Peichel cares about his players and cares about his program, well, you haven't been paying attention. And uh, he does very much. And I think at this point, though, um, you have to continue that, of course. And that's who he is. I mean, it's not an act. That's genuine. But at the same time, you have to build the roster the best way possible. And this is an opportunity to do that. And one that they did not expect uh, to come down the pike. And also, you know, if Nadango does ultimately leave and you can still replace him with, you know, Conte, uh, different skill set for sure. But um, I think that leads me to my next point, which is to appreciate the moment and where we're at with Rutgers men's basketball recruiting. I know people are nervous uh, with Hobbs leaving and Adango potentially leaving uh, and not signing. But, you know, just the fact that like now there's the option. I mean, you know, it's possible that if Nadango leaves, you replace him with a higher rated four star player. You know, or it's possible to get two four-star players with the highest recruit in, in in modern program history in the same class. And that's not even speaking about the 2024 class with Ace Bailey, the number five uh, composite ranking uh, national recruit 
uh, 24-7 sports composite rankings. I totally butchered that. But he's rated number five. And then you, he's verbally committed. Then you have the number four recruit in Dylan Harper. The two of them we've talked about a lot. I've written about, you know, getting close. The number six recruit um, is also has Rutgers in the top five, uh, which is uh, unbelievable. Uh, I don't think that Rutgers is going to win that battle. And, of course, yes, I'm stalling because I'm uh, – uh, Nas Cunningham, uh, New Jersey guy, uh, who's been playing in overtime elite. He's got Rutgers in the top five. He's ranked number six. So to have, you know, potentially this momentum in 2023, if they can close out this class, even if they just stick to what they had with Jermichael Davis and um, Bay Nadongo, it's a top top 40 class nationally. And then you go into 2024, you have Doquan Warren, a four-star guard, uh, you know, going to be great defensively. And I think, you know, he's another really athletic uh, point guard. You have him coming. Uh, He's verbally committed along with Ace Bailey and then potentially Dylan Harper. They're also recruiting Tyler Betsy, which it doesn't sound too good right now, just in terms of all the offers he got offered by Duke recently. Um, So, I just think, you know, as Rutgers fans, it, it's very hard to do this, but I think you have to take a step back and appreciate the level the level that Rutgers is at recruiting. And that, that goes with, you know, and, and I hinted at this last time, you know, NIL isn't just what collectives are doing. There's other NIL uh, resources out there, right? Alumni that want to give and contribute that aren't tied to any entity, you know, I think Rutgers is in a little bit better situation than most people think, but they're not certainly, you know, a heavy hitter yet, uh, if if ever, in terms of from an NIL perspective. Uh, and yet, Peichel is recruiting at the highest level. I mean, Rutgers has ever recruited at from a, a modern, you know, modern day uh, with the recruiting services and all that. I mean, it's it, it's pretty unbelievable, and I just think that. As nerve-wracking as this is right now, I know people are really antsy, and I apologize to those that sent me messages and tweeted at me. And you know, I just I, I needed to wait until I was comfortable talking about this. And um, we need to we need to appreciate where things are. And and I, I uh, it's going to be a couple of weeks, I think. You know, I mean, uh, it's only April eighteenth. Signing period just started a few days ago. I know people want to know. Obviously, the staff you know needs to know. Uh, because it's going to dictate what they do moving forward the rest of the offseason. So I do think, you know, April 18th here, I, I think it's going to be resolved before the month's over, uh, you know, maybe even the end of this week. Who knows? But things got even more interesting today with Papa Conte asking for his release and uh, national letter of intent. Um, and, I, you know, I, I it's reported out there, and, and, and uh, you know, like I said, um, Ant Wright has uh, reported it as well. Um, you know, I, I think that people get a misconception. I've already seen people, well, if, you know, he uh, if, if Conte had an academic issue to get into Michigan, I don't want him at Rutgers. Well, it's not an academic issue, you know, and, and from what I understand, he's a pretty bright kid. It's just um, admissions requirements for international students is different uh, in terms of there's additional things. And, you know, uh, this English as a second language test is supposedly very hard and it's very analytical. And, you know, it's... Uh, Michigan, to their credit, has a very high standard, but it's way above the normal standard. So, again, I don't know what he scored. I don't know what Rutgers' standard is exactly. Um, but I think it's fair to say that th- this is an option uh, that both I, – I think at a minimum th- there's got to be a conversation about it. And uh, we'll see what happens. You know, We'll see if it's a fit for both sides. Again, just because a player was recruited even a few months ago doesn't mean – they're a fit now. So the staff potentially has moved on and maybe they're, they're deep in other options. We're not aware of, you know, I do think that they, why well, no, they've been recruiting big men in the portal, you know, since um, day one. So uh, we'll just have to see, but I think that um, the roster is looking really intriguing right now. Uh, you know, and like I said, if Mulcahy and Cliff come back um, and, and I'll, I'll kind of end talking about the roster, uh, and I think the point that I wanted to make uh, was just in terms of, um, 
you know, if Mulcahy comes back, obviously he's going to play more off the ball, uh, gives them a secondary ball handler, but I, I don't think he'd be the primary. Well, I know he wouldn't be. I mean, uh, Noah Fernandez certainly would be. Uh, and then you have, um, but I think Paul can adjust. You know, I think he could evolve. I think it'll take, put less pressure on him. I really do think he can be a contributor in a different role. Um, you know, he shot uh, 37% or better from three-point range two of the last three seasons. He shot 39% uh, two seasons ago. So if he can really become kind of a spot-up three-shooter, uh, be a little more consistent from the foul line, uh, his passing, his vision, you know, his unselfishness, uh, improve defensively a little bit, you know, I really think that he could be uh, an asset for them again. And then uh, Cliff, you know, I, I think with Cliff, if he does return, Rutgers has to do a better job of getting him in space. Uh, I think it's clear that, you know, his post-up game uh, is uh, still in progress and he is best when he's in space. You know, when, when he's able to get uh, move around, uh, when he's able to get in the air, catch lob passes, dunks, um, you know, in transition. Um, but just when he, you know, when he posts up on the block, He's flat-footed, and he's kind of a sitting duck. You know, and he was tripled a lot at the end of last year. They just they need to move him around more. Uh, they need to let him be more mobile. They let it. They, they need to harness his athleticism. And um, so I I hope they get the chance, the staff, to do that. It'll be really fascinating to see how he develops next season. Um, but if Mulcahy and Cliff return, and you have, you know, so you have a backcourt of Derek Simpson, uh, Noah Fernandes, and Cam Spencer, and potentially Paul Mulcahy. You have, uh, you know, wings and uh, and threes and fours. You know, you have Mag, who I discussed last time, you know, should be back. Uh, well, Pico said he should be resuming part-time basketball activities by the end of summer. Uh, you have Antonio Chol, who's a development project, and I know the staff's high on. Then you have Andre Hyatt as of now returning. It sounds like he's going to return. You know, he had an up and down season, but obviously, um, you know, proven guy that gives you some big minutes. Uh, and then you have, um, so those three, uh, you have Gavin Griffiths adding into uh, the perimeter at the wing, uh, which is a huge addition. Um, I forgot to mention Davis, the guard. So let me go back. Uh, you have Simpson, Fernandes, Spencer, Davis, and Mulcahy. That's five right there. Uh, and I think, you know, Mulcahy he could play potentially, I don't know. I mean, could he play three? I don't know if he could defend the three. Be interesting to see. Then you have Mag, Chol, Hyatt uh, at the uh, three, four with Griffiths. That's nine. And then you have uh, Antoine Wolfolk, potentially Cliff. And then you throw in Nadongo and Conte. That would be a very versatile, a very athletic a more talented offensive lineup than Rutgers has had in a long time. And that would be exciting. And I think that it gives you a lot of um, depth, you know, some of it unproven uh, more than, you know, a, a good amount, but you also have a lot of proven guys back too. I think it's a really good blend. I think, I, I think that that would be, you know, and, and if they were able to do that, then, you know, they wouldn't be able to dip in the transfer portal anymore. But that's okay. I mean, listen, if I uh, – transfer portal is very um, tempting. But, you know, it just, it works the same for players that leave and, and look for better, better offers, better situations at other schools. The grass is not always greener. And if you have an opportunity uh, – and, again, if all things work out in terms of – Conte and Nadongo being viable options to sign for Rutgers, they should sign them both. I think uh, that's my take on it. I would love to have both. I think they both have major upside. I think they both are, are different enough that they can coexist and that you could, you could play them both at the same time. And it's a contingency for if Cliff leaves. So we'll see what happens. A lot covered here. I hope it was helpful. I hope it gets you excited about, the team for next year. I'm excited. And I just think, again, you know, the state of recruiting for Rutgers men's basketball right now, I mean, honestly, pinch me. Uh, I, I've been writing about Rutgers men's basketball recruiting, you know, since the Pike Alara started. And I can't tell you, I mean, it is, it's a cliche for Rutgers, but night and day, I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I, Pico always recruited the high end top, you know, uh, five-star, four-star kids that were local. Um, 
But, you know, I mean, I, if you remember back to Brian Antoine, Sky Lewis, I mean, those guys were very respectful of Peichel and Rutgers uh, and, you know, certainly gave Rutgers more consideration than I ex- would have expected at the time. But it was never really, you know, you never thought they had any legitimate chance to get them. And now look at where Rutgers is. It's it's unbelievable. So um, chew on that. I'll be back with more. Uh, I, I follow all my coverage at scarletfaithful.com. Uh, on my YouTube channel, Aaron Brightman. Uh, we're on Instagram, Scarlet Faithful. And uh, obviously, I'll be back with this podcast soon. So appreciate uh, everyone listening once again. You can also follow me on Twitter at Aaron underscore Brightman. And uh, again, thank you for everyone's support for following the Scarlet Faithful. And uh, stay optimistic. I think the 2023 class is going to end up being uh you know a, a really good one and a springboard for 2024 better days are certainly ahead